Yeah, thank you very much, Arlette. And uh, yeah, again, apologies for the uh, little bit of a mix up of things happened. And uh, God's always capable of taking good out of an unfortunate situation. I think it's very appropriate that this topic is presented during the October of Easter. Um, and you'll understand why as we progress through the, the particular points. I'm going to have a look at the Passover. And the first half of this presentation, we're going to have an understanding of the Passover as the Jews tradi traditionally um, enacted it um, in their own homes, in their own <coughs> liturgies, etc., up until the time of Christ. And then we're going to have a look at how Jesus celebrated the Passover and how his Passover was different. And we call his Passover the Passover of the Messiah. And then we're going to have a look at the consequences for us as Catholics, as Christians. What is the legacy of that for us today in, our, in the worship of the church, in our liturgical worship, in our private worship, etc. So we hope we have new and deeper understandings. None of this, none of what I'm presenting tonight is original. Um, for those who have been following the work of certain American apologists, and converts, etc., over the last few years, will recognise a lot of what I'm portraying tonight is coming from originally Dr. Scott Hahn and his uh, classic work on the on the fourth cup, and also in more recent times by Dr. Brant Petrie, who published a book. Uh, that came out that I read in 2017, a fabulous book called The Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, which I highly recommend. I'll be honest with you, I haven't read the fourth cup, though I'm very familiar with the general thesis. Uh, but I have read Brant Petrie's book on the J Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, and I found it an absolutely fascinating read. And the two wonderful things about reading that book is that you'll learn an enormity, and it's an easy book to read. It's, it's very solid, it's very theological, but it's the type of English that anyone could just pick up and read, and it's captivating. You won't be able to put it down. So I highly recommend if you get the access to that book. Now, so let's have a look at the Passover, the traditional Jewish practice. Uh, the Feast of the Passover, otherwise known as Pesach, and it's the annual great Jewish memorial event. There's a lot of words I'm going to use when I look at the Jewish Passover that's going to twig your memory or you know, set certain lights flashing because they're going to sound very Catholic and very liturgical. So we're talking about here a memorial meal when we talk about the Passover. But the Feast of Passover wasn't just one event or one celebration on a particular night. It's an eight-day festival. And it starts on the, in, on the same day in the Jewish calendar every year. Now, I hope I don't lose you here. It might get a little bit complicated. The Jewish calendar is not the same as our calendar. The Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar. So it has 13 months following the cycle of the moon, from new moon to full moon, 28 days. And the eight-day festival of the Passover is always celebrated in the first month of the Jewish year, which is Nisan, the month of Nisan. And because the Jewish calendar is not the same as ours, the, the month of Nisan is not always the same as our month of April. So it could vary somewhere in March and April. But in the Jewish calendar, the Feast of Passover is always celebrated on the same day. It begins on the same day in the Jewish calendar, even though that's a different day in our calendar every year. So the day it begins is the first day of unleavened bread. Now, I remember when I used to watch the, those beautiful movies from the 50s and 60s, those good you know, Christian cl classics like King of Kings and Ben-Hur and you know, Ten Commandments, you know, before them, ben, um, uh, The Robe and Quo Vadis, I think they're five great movies they made in 10 years. One of those movies, not the best one, and not, uh, and not an accurate one, but at least a pious and inspirational one, was King of Kings. And you hear the term there in that movie, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 
or the time of unleavened bread. So this, this is the other name for the Passover festival. And the unleavened bread, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, began on the 14th of Nisan. Now, st strictly speaking, it began in the night of the 14th of Nisan, which was no longer, in Jewish reckoning, the 14th of Nisan, but the beginning of the 15th of Nisan. So another difference between Jewish reckoning of dates and times and hours is that we determine a day from midnight to midnight, the 24 hours between midnight and midnight. But the Jews determined it from uh, 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. the next day. That was their 24 hour cycle, roughly 6 p.m. I say that because it was when sun set. When sun set, that was the beginning of the next day. So imagine it's the 14th of Nisan in the Jewish calendar and you're a pious Jew and you're, began, you're about to begin the celebration of the Passover meal. You begin after the sunset. It's no longer the 14th of Nisan. It's the 15th of Nisan. And the feast goes, continues on to the 22nd of Nisan. Right. The Passover meal, today the modern name for it is Seder which means, or the Seder meal, you might hear that from time to time, it means order. And it has an order. And it was liturgical. Uh, like us in the Catholic Church, with our priestly work, the liturgical work, namely the, the liturgy, the Mass, right? It has an order. And we as faithful are not free to really tamper with that, even though many do, unfortunately, to the detriment of, of the liturgy. And same with the Passover, it was a liturgy, it was an order. It was firstly, as I already said, it was a memorial meal. What was it remembering? It was remembering the Exodus event. What was the Exodus event? It was the liberation of the Hebrew peoples from the bondage of Egypt, from slavery in Egypt. All up, the Hebrews were there for 430 years. We know the Old Testament. It begins in Genesis. It begins with the story of Joseph. Joseph going into Egypt. The famine that led then his father and brothers to come into Egypt. And at first, when that, that group, of, that family group of 70 to 75 people came into Egypt, they were welcomed in Egypt, one, because they were small, but two, because they were the family of the vizier, the chamberlain, the, the prime minister of Egypt, the, the right-hand man of the pharaoh, who was now Joseph, and you know the story. But as scripture says, the next pharaoh, another pharaoh came to power who did not know Joseph. And historians tell us that was a, an internal revolution in Egypt that overthrew the reign of the Hyksos. The Hyksos were dominating Egypt, and they are non-Egyptians, and they are Semitic peoples, and that's why they saw they gave some favoritism to Joseph and his family because they were Semites as well. But the Egyptians retook control of their own country, and, and later Pharaoh had no kind attitude towards this growing number of Hebrews. So for the next 400 years, they were in bondage. And over that 400 year period, they grew in numbers. And going by the numbers we read in the book of Genesis, there were over 2 million men. And you can multiply that by millions more. Well, there was, no, sorry, it was about 600,000 men. And multiply that, their wives, their children. You're talking about over 2 million Hebrews in that part of the Nile Delta called Goshen. And as we know the story, if you know anything about the Moses story, uh, what Pharaoh tried to do, the massacre of the, of the Hebrew children, that massacre that Moses providentially escaped, the, the Egyptians were fearful of the growing numbers of the Hebrews. Uh, I won't go through the whole story of Exodus, but you do know, you know, God calls Moses. Moses is the deliverer who's going to lead the Hebrews from bondage, the challenge up against Pharaoh, the plagues that tried to coerce Pharaoh to let the Hebrews go, 
uh, Pharaoh's stubbornness, but then ultimately the 10th, the last, and the worst of the plagues, which was the Passover of the angel of death. And how were the Hebrews exempt from this chastisement that afflicted the firstborn of the Egyptians, humans as well as animals, was that the Hebrews were asked to get a lamb, uh, slaughter that lamb, get its blood and uh, brush the blood of the lamb over the lintels of the doors and the windows. And the angel of death passing over Egypt would inflict death upon the firstborn of Egypt, but would spare those in every house that was marked by the blood of the lamb. And this was the Passover. Those Jewish homes, or those Hebrew homes to be more precise, were passed over and spared. And that catastrophe upon Egypt was what broke the stubbornness of Pharaoh. And ultimately he relented, albeit for a short moment, he relented and allowed the Hebrews to leave Egypt under the leadership of Moses, and thus began the Exodus. The, this was a huge event in the history of the chosen people. It was that, form, that foundational formative event of the Hebrew nation, uh, moving from a tribe, now moving to a nation, etc. And we, we know the rest of the story after that. So this Passover meal which, be, which is on the first day of unleavened bread in the Passover uh, festival, uh, was to commemorate, was to remember this exodus. But what type of memorial was it? Now, normally when we think about memorial, we reflect on something that happened in the past. Okay, we're coming up to Anzac Day, one of Australia's very important memorials. We remember the sacrifice of all Australian soldiers who've given their lives at uh, serving this country, beginning at Gallipoli and uh, thereafter. We reflect on that. We remember that. We honour those who served, those who lost their lives, those who sacrificed in one way or another. But the Passover Memorial Meal was more than just reflecting on a Passover event. It was in what we call in Greek an anonesis. An anonesis a type of memorial that makes present a past event. So it's a memorial meal that reenacted the Exodus. This is a memorial meal, liturgical, celebrated in what context? In the family context. It's celebrated in the home. And the family are enacting it or remembering in a way as if they themselves are about to depart from Egypt in haste. Now bank that as well, memorial, but an anamnesis, and a memorial that makes a past event now present. So how is it made present? We have the father as the presider, we have the mother present, we have the children and the youngest of the children is meant to ask the question, how is this night different from all other nights? And then the father would then proceed to relate the covenants with Abraham and Moses and the whole Exodus event. And they were relating it as if it's happening in the now, as if they themselves were part of it and they themselves were about to escape from Egypt then and then as well. Now this is done in a certain order. In the Passover meal, there were four cups. We've heard this before, we'll, we'll relate them again now. The first cup is the Kedush cup. The, after the drinking of the Kedush cup, we have the relating of the, by the father of the covenants with Abraham and Moses in the Exodus event. And that leads up to the second cup. So the second cup, that's drunk in the, in the Passover meal, is the proclamation cup, the proclamation of Scripture, the Haggadah. And in the proclamation of Scripture, we're relating the covenants with Abraham and Moses in the Exodus event. Then we have the cup of blessing, the Berakah cup. That's the third cup. Remember that as well. There's a lot here of my, I'm going to ask you to bank as we go along. Memorial, Ananesis, Cup of Blessing. And then the fourth cup is the Cup of Praise. 
the Hallel cup. So Kadush, uh, the proclamation, the Berakha, and the Hallel cups. In English, I remember it this way. KPBP. Kadush, proclamation, blessing, praise. What happens in between the second and the third cups in this traditional memorial meal? We have certain foods which are consumed, which are eaten. And these are specifically chosen and they're highly symbolic. We have the bitter herbs, the horseradish and the horror scent. We have the unleavened bread and we have the roasted lamb. These are all consumed between the second and the third cups. What do these foods symbolize? The eating of the bitter herbs was to remember the bitterness of bondage in Egypt. The eating of the unleavened bread, today it's called the matzot, the unleavened bread, bread that had, had not risen, that's flat, was to remember the haste in which they had to leave Egypt. They didn't have time to even let the, the, the dough in the bread, make the bread rise and then leave after the bread has risen. They had to get out that quickly. And then we have the eating of the roasted lamb. Why is the lamb here? Because the lamb played a very important part in the original uh, Exodus event, in the Passover. It was the blood of the lamb that spared the Hebrews and their firstborn from the angel of death. Now, let's focus on this roasted lamb for the moment. And again, I'm about to say many things that's going to twig your Christian mind here, your Catholic mind. The Hebrews couldn't, and later on the Jews, just couldn't use any old lamb. In fact, they couldn't use an old lamb at all. They had to be a young lamb. It had to be male, had to be one year of age, had to be spotless, unblemished, perfect. So they couldn't get a sickly lamb or a crippled lamb or a, 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 any, any lamb with any defect. Who does that remind you of? Um, remind you of? A spotless lamb. And this lamb was the father. Now, Passover as an event in ancient Israel was colossal. I can just imagine being there. By today's standards, it's still colossal. They estimate over 250,000 lambs were slaughtered on the 14th of Nisan to, uh, to provide the necessary lambs that will be roasted and eaten for the Passover meal that night. That night, which would be the beginning of the 15th of Nisan. So you imagine not only the 250,000 plus lambs being slaughtered, but the amount of blood that's being drained. The amount of men that are coming from all over the world, whether from the Holy Land or beyond the, the, Jew, the Hebrew or the Jewish diaspora. Men coming with the spotless lamb to have the, lamb, the throat slit, the blood drained, and then the lamb is skewered. It's skewered with two sticks in a T-shape. Does that signify something to you? And then the father comes back with the lamb, skewered, and then barbecues it, roasts it for consumption during the Passover meal with the family in Jerusalem. So here we have a spotless lamb who's crucified, drained of all blood, and then consumed in Jerusalem. So what this tells us, um, now of course it was an absolute obligation to follow the rubrics of this Passover meal without question, and that included consuming the roasted lamb, drained of all blood. So in a sense, no, in a real sense, in an absolute sense, the ancient Passover meal was a memorial and an anesis, but also a sacrifice, a temple sacrifice. So what does that remind you of again? And a liturgical event, that's a memorial and also a sacrifice. Just as I put in parenthesis now, this realisation here, modern day Judaism and its Passover meal is substantially different to this. Why? Because they no longer have a temple. 
They, they don't have the sacrifices associated with that temple. They still have the Levitical priesthood. I've met a Levite here in Sydney. So they still have a priesthood that could sacrifice animals to God. But they can't because they can't do it anywhere in the world except the Temple Mount. There's no temple there and there can't be one rebuilt at least for the foreseeable future because you've got two Islamic mosques sitting right one one end, Alaska, and the Dome of the Rock right in the centre of the Temple Mount. And if any Jewish attempt to remove those mosques were to take place, it would be all out war, not just the Arab world, but the whole Islamic world. So uh, the memorial meal that Jews celebrate today, the Passover, is not a sacrifice. Because you can't have sacrifice without the temple. It has to occur in the temple. All right. Now, after they consume, then they drink the cup of blessing, the third cup. Then they have the recitation of the Hallel Psalms, Psalms 115 to 118. That's between the third and the fourth cups. And once they're complete, you have the final words. You have the drinking of the final, the fourth cup, the cup of praise. And the presider, the father, on completing the consumption of the fourth cup, says it is finished. It is consummated. And then the Passover meal is finished. Now, why is this important for us? We're not Jewish. We don't celebrate the Passover. But go back to the title of that book by Dr. Brand Petrie, The Jewish Roots of the Eucharist. A lot of what I've just said should be twigging your Christian minds right now, your Catholic minds right now in many ways. Let's now look at the Passover of the Messiah. The Passover Jesus himself celebrated with the disciples. That meal we call traditionally the Last Supper. What's at a Passover meal? The answer to that question, when you read the Gospels, is yes, it was. It was originally a Passover meal, but was it the same as the traditional Passover celebrated beforehand and by other Jews at that time? Now, Jesus would have celebrated Passover with his disciples a couple of times already. Can't be so sure how many, maybe three, maybe two. And he would have celebrated in the normal manner, the, no the normal liturgical manner, according to the rubrics I've just outlined. It's interesting that Luke's Gospel records the following words of Jesus. It is with, des it is with desire that I have desired to eat this Pasch with you. In other words, Jesus is yearning to celebrate the Passover meal with his disciples, this time round, with a lot more earnest than he would have had in the previous Passover meals he shared with them. Why? Because it was going to be different. He was going to change it. And he was going to change it for a very important reason. This, the Passover of the Messiah, to cut straight to the chase, is the Passover, the new Passover, that will provide a new manner for the new people of God for a new exodus to a new promised land. That is the true vocation of the Messiah, which very few Jews at the time of Jesus and leading up to his time had a realisation of. They were more focused on a Messiah who would be a warrior king liberator or drive out the Romans, reunite the traditional lands of the 12 tribes, reconstitute the ancient kingdom of David and Solomon, a Messiah that will be victorious over the Romans, purge these lands of all Greco-Roman pagan influence, uh, be enthroned on Mount Zion as a triumphant light to the Gentiles who reign undisturbed to the end of time. And through this victorious messianic figure, the rest of the world will come to know the true God, Yahweh. Pretty good. What a grand picture. I probably would have been looking forward to that picture. If I was living then, that would be my expectation, perhaps. It was the majority view of the, 
of the of Jews at that time. Pious Jews waiting for the Messiah. In fact, that was so entrenched. You go to the Acts of the Apostles chapter 1, and there's the scene of the ascension of Jesus about to ascend into heaven. So you have Our Lady, you have the Apostles, you have the, all other disciples there on Mount Olivet, and someone asked the question of Jesus, is this the time when you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel? So even then, after the resurrection, there's still pious Jews, now Christians, followers of Jesus, right there at this Mount Olivet, waiting for Jesus to make visible this new glorious kingly military kingdom. Anyway, how was the Passover of Jesus that he celebrated with the disciples there on the night of the Last Supper different? Well, one, it was not celebrated with the family. It was celebrated with the 12 disciples. There was no focus from what we read from the gospel accounts on mentioning covenants with Abraham or with Moses or a recitation of the Exodus event. But there is a reference to another covenant with the consecration of the third cup. This is the blood of the new and eternal covenant. What covenant is Jesus referring to? Well, Christians looking at that uh, see a reference to Jeremiah 31, the prophecy there that God will establish a new and eternal covenant. Well, that would include the Gentiles. There's no mention of eating the, a Passover lamb. We'll come to that, uh, the reason for that in a moment. There's a mention of take, eat, this is my body. Take, drink, this is my blood. Was there a lamb, a slaughtered lamb in the Passover meal eaten by Jesus with his disciples there on the Holy Thursday night, the Last Supper? Most people would say no. Why? The clue is in John's Gospel rather than the other Gospels. Now this gets a little bit complicated and I hope I don't lose you here. When you look at John's Gospel and the reference is John 19, 14, basically, according to his chronology, John's reckoning, Jesus celebrates his last supper with the disciples on the night of the 13th of Nisan. The night of the 13th of Nisan is the beginning of the 14th of Nisan. And Jesus is then crucified in midday on the 14th of Nisan. Dies 3 p.m. on the 14th of Nisan. Jews ordinarily would be celebrating Passover that day, that year, on the night of the 14th of Nisan, not the night of the 13th of Nisan, a day after Jesus celebrated his last supper, the Passover meal, the last supper with his disciples. The lambs that were needed, that needed to be slaughtered and used for the Passover meal, were slaughtered on the 14th of Nisan. Jesus has his Passover on the 13th of Nisan, so how could he have had a lamb from the temple that had been slaughtered and drained of blood? The lambs are being slaughtered in the temple for the Passover meal that will occur that night for all faithful Jews. At the same time, Jesus is being crucified on the cross. That's what we know from John's Gospel. Now... That is distinct, however, from, say, Mark 14, 12. When you read Mark 14, 12, you get this very strong impression that Jesus has the Passover, his last supper, the same time as the Passover meal of all other Jews, which would have meant the night of the 14th of Nisan, which was the beginning of the 15th of Nisan. So Jesus is crucified not on the 14th of Nisan, but the 15th of Nisan according to Mark's Gospel. Is this a contradiction? Um, the answer to that question is probably not. 
Now, I've got it somewhere else here in the text to give you the reason for that later on. Okay. There is the two different accounts on the day Jesus is crucified. John tells us it's the 14th of Nisan. Mark will tell us it's the 15th of Nisan. Why is there a divergence? We'll look at that in a little while later. <clears throat> now, how do we know that Jesus... Okay, so let's look at the Last Supper here. Jesus takes the unleavened bread. He says, take, eat, this is my body. That's another significant difference, a massive difference to a traditional Passover meal. He takes the cup, take, drink, this is my blood of the new and eternal covenant shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this in memory of me or commemoration of me. How do we know he took the third cup and consecrated that and made that his precious blood? The hint is actually in, in St. Paul, first letter to Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 16. St. Paul is upbraiding the Corinthians for their very poor liturgical practices. Okay? In an early church, which was still developing the way they would do it, and there were abuses happening, terrible abuses. And St. Paul says, the cup of blessing which we bless, isn't this a participation in Christ's blood? The word cup of blessing is the clue here. It, the, what's carried on into the Christian community, into the agape meal, what well, that's the early name of the mass, right? Was the same term they used for the third cup in the Passover meal, the cup of blessing. So you know from that, which is a strong piece of evidence, that Jesus takes the third cup and consecrates that as his precious blood. After Jesus consecrates the third cup into his precious blood, what happens next? Well, what should ordinarily happen after the drinking of the third cup is they sing the Hallel Psalms. Is there any evidence of that in the Gospels that Jesus did that with his disciples? There is, but it's again different. It's not done in the upper room. Now, I should have said this all been done in the upper room, okay? I will come back to the significance of the upper room in, in a little while. But it says in Matthew 26.30 and Mark 14.26, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. They sung a hymn and they went out. They didn't sing hymns 1, 15, 16, 17, 18. They sang a hymn. So they didn't sing all four hymns. They sang the first one and they went out. They went to the Garden of Gethsemane. So they didn't sing the other, they didn't sing the other or recite the other hymns as far as we know. And there's no evidence they drank the fourth cup in the upper room. Has the Passover ended? Has the Last Supper ended? No, it hasn't. The Passover, the Messiah, continues. He's changing the meal and he's changing the event into a new Passover and affecting a new exodus. So it continues. Jesus has gone to the Garden of Gethsemane. What's he saying in the Garden of Gethsemane, among other things? Take this chalice of affliction away from me. Take this cup of affliction away from me. Nevertheless, that your will be done, not mine. Now here, Jesus finally, if I could say this, seizes that moment when he becomes obedient to the will of the Father and is the new Adam making reparation for the sin of the old Adam, the original Adam. Go back to the original Adam. He's in the garden. He essentially says to God, I, I will do my will, not your will. I'll eat the fruit of that tree, okay? And I, I don't believe that I will die. And so there's disobedience. Let my will be done, not yours, essentially is the sin of the first Adam, the old Adam. 
Here Christ, the new Adam, who's also the new Moses, by the way, okay, at the same time. Christ, the new Adam, is in another garden, and in reparation for the sin of, uh, of Adam's disobedience, the new Adam obeys. Let thy will be done, not mine. But notice the language here. The temptation is, I don't want to drink the cup of affliction. But he says, yes, I will. Jesus knows what's coming. He knows the cross is coming. And he describes the cross as a chalice, as a cup of affliction. There's another cup he has to drink. And you've already understood this. That's the fourth cup that he didn't drink in the upper room. He will drink it, but not in the upper room, but on the cross. So when Jesus says this, that thy will be done, not mine, he's arrested, the trial, the condemnation, the mockery, the scourging, the crowning of thorns, the carrying of the cross, the crucifixion is all part of this new Passover liturgy. It hasn't ended. Now, we're now into the morning of the 14th of Nisan, according to John's chronology. It's still the same day as the previous night, which began at sunset. So this all happening in the 14th of Nisan. Still continuing. This is a long Passover memorial or meal. Okay? <clears throat> when Jesus gets to Mount Calvary, he's offered wine mingled with gall. We read that in Matthew 26, 31. It's an anesthetic. It's meant to numb the victim who's about to be crucified, the most excruciating pain. And it's a bit of mercy on the part of the Romans to the criminal who's about to be crucified that if they drink this wine mixed with gall, the pain will be less on the cross. Jesus refuses to drink it. And the reason why, it's again liturgical. Because in the original Passover liturgy, the rubrics, it was forbidden to drink anything between the third and the fourth cup. Jesus is now between the third and the fourth cup. So he won't drink anything before he drinks his fourth cup that's coming up. On the cross, Jesus says, I thirst. There's a lot of spiritual writings into those words. It's seven words of Jesus on the cross. I thirst. And then we get the soldier puts his spear uh, the sponge with vinegar onto the spear holds it up to jesus jesus drinks it and then he says it is finished and then he dies that moment jesus has dr has drunk in the fourth cup when he drinks the wine on the sponge and he recites the normal words that the presider would normally say at the end of the passover meal it is accomplished it is finished it is consummated. Jesus says it now on the cross. So at that moment, the, the Passover of the Messiah is affected, is completed. And what does this Passover do? What does this Passover do as distinct from the original one? Well, the original one, the Passover event, liberated the Hebrews from the slavery of Egypt. And then they went out under the leadership of their deliverer, Moses. Of course, Pharaoh changes his mind and comes after them. There's a symbolism in that. They passed through the waters of the Reed Sea or the Sea of Reeds or the Red Sea, however you want to translate it. St. Paul in his first letter of the Corinthians says that's the Hebrew people's being baptized into Moses. Then the waters collapse upon the Egyptian army. Pharaoh's like sin, relentless, won't give up, always comes back at us. But the sin is destroyed when the Egyptian army is destroyed by the waters of the uh, Sea of Reeds, which is like the waters of baptism, destroying sin. But after baptism, we've got the journey through our Sinai. The Hebrews have their 40 years in Sinai because of their cowardice, their disobedience, 
their sin, they're given an extra chastisement, wandering through Sinai until all that generation is dead, except for Joshua and Caleb. And then after 40 years, they come to the threshold there of the river of Jordan, the east bank of the Jordan, and Moses has a view, but is not allowed to enter, dies on Mount Nebo at the age of 120, and the Hebrews under Joshua then proceed into the promised land. That's the Exodus event that's remembered in the Passover meal. Jesus ex will execute another Exodus, and he begins it with the Passover of the Messiah. But one more point I'll make before I go into that in detail. Remember the point about the differentiation between John and Mark's Gospels about when the crucifixion occurred and is there a discrepancy? At first instance, you'd say there is. Okay? There's a contradiction in the Gospels. There's an error. Therefore, they're not the word of God. They're the word of men and all that. You know, that's, you're now in a, a, a liberal seminary. No, sorry. Okay. All right. But there is a theory I heard and there are different theories here, and I forget the name of the cardinal who wrote some years ago um, as an explanation as to what really is going on here. I mean, Jesus is crucified only once, and it's on one particular day, but his theory is that there were two calendars operating at the time. And Mark reflects the calendar of the Sadducees, the priestly caste in Jerusalem, while John's reflecting the calendar of the Essene community. Now, the Essenes were a religious community on the outskirts there in the desert, Qumran, near the Dead Sea. And they were radical reformers who rejected the corruption of the priestly caste and others in Jerusalem. And they lived like ascetic monks, you know, pre-Catholic monasticism. But they also had a presence in Jerusalem. And they followed a different calendar, a liturgical calendar, a slight difference to the Sadducees one. And perhaps Jesus was following that calendar. And what's the clue that he was doing that? Where was the Last Supper? Where did it occur? Which part of Jerusalem? Well, the experts tell us, well, some experts tell us it was in the southwestern part of the old city of Jerusalem. Therefore, in the Essene quarter. There's some people who speculate that maybe even John the Baptist was certainly we can say in some way associated with the Essene community. There's some people who speculate even further that perhaps Our Lady and St. Joseph might have had some connection with the Essene community. I don't know what that evidence is. But what's the evidence that Jesus celebrates the Last Supper in the Essene quarter of the old city? It's a very oblique uh, clue. It's in Luke 22.10. When Jesus tells his disciples to go you know, have the upper room set up, he says, you'll see a man carrying a jug of water. And that's the clue. Why is that the clue? Why? Because men in ancient Israel did not carry jugs of water. Don't want to be offensive here, but I'm talking about the times back then. Carrying jugs of water was seen as quote unquote women's work. I don't want to put it in an offensive way, but that's, they thought that in that time. Men do not carry jugs of water. Women did. So why is there a man in this part of Jerusalem carrying a jug of water? It's because he's celibate. He's not married. He doesn't have a wife to do that for him. Who are celibate in ancient Israel? The Essenes were. They lived like monks. They had a presence in Jerusalem during the Passover. And that's where Jesus celebrates his Passover meal with the disciples in the Essene quarter following the Essene calendar. So I just want to throw that in there. It's interesting. Very interesting. All right. So what, what Jesus does with the Passover meal, he transforms it from a memorial of a past exodus into not just another memorial, but a new event. So it's not just a new Passover. It's a new Passover that actually affects a new exodus. Jesus here is the new Moses. And as I said earlier, he's affecting, as the new Moses, celebrating a new Passover. 
giving us a new manna for a new exodus to a new promised land. So going back to what I related earlier concerning the original Passover event, all that event that we read in Exodus is literal historical fact, despite what many might say to the contrary. But it's also an allegory, meaning it has a secondary, deeper spiritual meaning. So yes, Moses, the original Moses, now we have a new Moses, Jesus. We have the original 12 tribes of the people of God, but now we have the, a new people of God that are going to be built on the 12 disciples who are going to be the 12 apostles. And it's going to be a universal people, not limited by race or geography. It's going to be the, the Messiah who celebrates the new Passover will be celebrating it for the Jews, through the Jews, for all peoples. And these new peoples, this new Israel, will pass through not the waters of the Reed Sea, but the waters of baptism. And what will be destroyed is not the Egyptian army, but sin. And then after baptism, we live our normal Christian life through our own Sinai. Now, 40 years is a symbolic number. It means a number of things. It also means a generation, uh, a lifetime, so to speak, basically, generally. Considering that the average age of men in, in the first century Roman Empire was only 42, you know, 40 years is roughly a generation. I'm glad it's not 42 at the moment because I wouldn't be able to give this talk. Okay, um, and that journey post-baptism is difficult, it's hard, it's a struggle, there's temptations, we fall, we fail, we get up again, we repent. That was the story of ancient Israel and Sinai. But like ancient Israel, the new Israel, the universal Israel will be fed. And the ancient Israel is fed by quails that provided meat, but every day the manna, which came six days a week, you a bread from heaven that was like a white film on the ground. The manna in Hebrew meant, there's a word, which, what is it? When they first saw it, they said, what is it? Manna, what is it? And they, they it kept that name, the what is it bread. They came six days a week and twice a double portion on the Friday because they didn't do any work to gather the bread on the Sabbath. And that sustained them every day along this journey for 40 years. Likewise, we have a new manna arising from the new Passover, the Messiah. And you don't have to be a genius to work out what that is. It's the Eucharist. Take, eat, this is my body. Take, drink, this is my blood. That's given to us first in the Passover meal of the Messiah. And then he says, do this in commemoration of me. So it was meant to be done and provided to the new people of God universally for all time until his second coming. And that is the bread, the heavenly bread, the sacred body, precious blood of Christ that we receive every day as the food for the journey to get us to the other threshold, the spiritual threshold, passing not from the east bank of the Jordan to the west bank of the Jordan, but from this life, not into the... Uh, the old promised land, but the new promised land of the heavenly Jerusalem. That's what Jesus does as the Messiah in his Passover. And that Passover, the event that he, the exodus that he effects for us is the escape from the slavery of sin and anointing us as the new people of God for the heavenly kingdom. Now, some other things we could say here. <clears throat> the new manna, interesting here. I just make a side point here, uh, relating to when Jesus taught us the Our Father. We find it in Luke's Gospel, chapter 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Now I'm focusing on the new manna from the new Passover. Daily bread. Now when we think of daily bread, give us this day 
our daily bread, a bit of a tautology there, isn't it? Uh, am I criticizing the words of Jesus? I mean, it's the perfect prayer. It's the Lord's prayer. It's not my prayer. I'm not in any position to criticize it. But my point is, is that the original meaning of the words? Because in Greek of Luke, the word is epiousion. Give us this day our epiousion bread. Epiousion. Two Greek words. By the way, Brant Petrie makes it very clear that this word, epi, he puts it as epiousios. I looked it up today in a lexicon for Luke and it had epiousion. Whether it's epiousios or epiousion, I'm not in a position to comment. But uh, Brant Petrie makes it clear that this word is a, what's called a neologism. What's that? A new word. It doesn't exist anywhere in any other Greek manuscript anywhere in the world. It appears for the first time in the Gospel of Luke. Give us this day our epiousion bread. Epiousios, above substance. Give us this day our above substance bread. And when you look at some of the church fathers, like Tertullian and St. Cyprian of Carthage, and then more than a century later, St. Cyril of Jerusalem in his catechetical lectures, mid fourth century, when they comment on the Our Father, give us this day our daily bread, they include in that the Eucharist as our daily bread. In fact, St. Cyril translates it as supersubstantial bread. Give us this day our supersubstantial bread, our super bread. More than the normal bread, yes, we're asking for our normal bread, mm -hmm. and give us this day our daily bread doesn't mean just bread, it means our health, our clothing, our home, all our material and physical needs. But these fathers and saints are saying it includes the Eucharist. And I remember, I've been to Jerusalem a few times, hope to go again one day. But uh, there's where the, our father was first taught by our Lord, like in other places in, 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 uh, in Jerusalem in the outskirts, wherever something significant was like the Magnificat or the Our Father, you get all these pl plaques, beautiful tiled plaques on walls of the Our Father or the Magnificat or the Hail Mary or whatever in multiple languages, 70, 80 languages. So when I was there at the site last time in 2018, I didn't notice this in previous visits, but after I read Brent Petrie's book in 2017, I noticed this in 2018. The plaque that has the Our Father in Latin in Jerusalem has the words, uh, Panam nostrum quotidianum de novus hodie, uh, and give us a stay of day. It doesn't have quotidianum. That's daily bread. It has super substantialum. Has give us this day our super substantial bread. So when I saw that, I was excited. I made a little video, which is a 50 second, 50 second video, which is on my YouTube channel. Plug in the YouTube channel, uh, which highlights this point. In Jerusalem, the translation of the Our Father in Latin has super substantial bread. And we should keep that in mind. I think that's perfectly consistent with our Catholic faith. Now, this new manna given to us um, by the Messiah in his new Passover is available to the new people of God every day through the command of Christ. And likewise, as we said about the Passover meal of ancient Israel, a memorial and a sacrifice, our agape meal, our divine liturgy, our mass, whatever you want to call it, is also a memorial and a sacrifice. Now, that's another subject altogether. I won't go into that in detail now. It is a memorial. Do this in commemoration of me. We're remembering the, the Passover the new Passover, the Messiah, and not just that, but the exodus he effected through that event. The exodus of the Messiah begins in the upper room on the night, the beginning of the, fi of the 15th of Nisan, or so 14th of Nisan, according to John, and ends 3 p.m. on the 14th of Nisan, all within that one day. That's what we... When we, when we go to Mass and we, we uh, hear the words, do this in commemoration of me, that's what we ought to be commemorating, that new exodus of the Messiah. And then we receive the new manna from that new Passover, which is the spiritual food for that new journey. 
So the mass is also an anamnesis. As a memorial meal and a sacrifice, it's making present a past event. Now go back to the Passover of ancient Israel. They remembered and made present the Exodus event and reenacting it as if they were there that night, under, undergoing it again that night. What the Mass does, it's also an anamnesis, but much more substantial. It's substantially an anamnesis. It does make present to us a past event. So at Mass, we're not just remembering what Jesus did for us in his Passover event to affect the new Exodus, the cross on Mount Calvary. We're not only just reflecting on that as a past event, as Protestants would do. We are making that past event present. We are present to it as if we were there ourselves. We are making, uh, and now of course we have the whole controversy about whether the Mass is an additional sacrifice, another sacrifice. It's not additional, it's not another. It's making that one uh, sacrifice of Christ done in time, only once in time made present now. At the same time, it's making what's happening in heaven present now. So the Mass, in a sense, it's, how do, I don't know, I don't have the word for it. It's making a past event present, but it's making an heavenly event also present. Because the Christ that we receive in the Eucharist is not a dead Christ crucified. It's the glorified, resurrected Christ. What Christ is doing now at the right hand of the Father, he's not just a prayerful intercessor. He's a priestly intercessor. He's the one eternal high priest of the heavenly temple. You get that from Hebrews 12, 23. He's the one mediator whose blood speaks louder than Abel's. You get that from Revelation. I think chapter 5, verse 6, thereabout. You know, the lamb that appears slain but is standing upright. This is in the heavenly vision of St. John. Of the lamb appearing slain but standing upright well jesus appears slain in heaven because he rises from the dead in a glorified body but with the five wounds still there in his glorified body because he those are trophies of the victory that he achieved but also that is the symbolically how he will continue to offer the sacrifice of mount calvary perpetually in heaven on behalf of the church so Christ in heaven, as the one eternal high priest, well, as priest, what is he offering in heaven? Not a new or additional sacrifice to what he did on Mount Calvary in time, but the same sacrifice he did on Mount Calvary in time, offering that perpetually in heaven. And that is what we make present in the Mass. So in the Mass, heaven is touching earth. So in a sense, we are present at Mount Calvary, and we're also present at heaven at the same time. And so the Mass enables us to offer to the Father the same sacrifice Christ offered to the Father on Mount Calvary and what Christ perpetually offers to the Father now in heaven. And hopefully that gives you more inspiration about Mass and daily communion. The Old Testament manna stopped on arrival to the Holy Land. The Eucharist stops on arrival to the heavenly promised land. On that note, we'll finish. Thank you very much.